So we're going to go traveling again, this not to a place, um, but we're going to talk about coffee. And I bet, Marion, do you have coffee with you? I've got no, coffee. No, it's tea. I've actually had to give up coffee. So this may send me into a tailspin. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've reduced my coffee, but I've got it right now. Well, you know, I was a, first a school teacher and then a ministry director. I had coffee pumping through my veins yeah. for most yeah. of my life. I was weaned on milk coffee by my mother. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, for some of you, actually, I think for Tony, um, that meme there, uh, you know, about fairy tales being real, that you can drink a potion made from magic beans. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's, that's somewhat true. Um, we sort of alluded last week, and I, I talked about the Forbidden City, about the importance of tea in the world, because really up until 1900, the only place tea was grown was in China. Mm -hmm. And if, if you wanted tea, you had to go to the Chinese. And this desire for tea um, by the Western world, particularly by the, the English, but also throughout Europe, um, caused them to change their relationships to China um, and change the world. But coffee really changed America. Now, in, in interest of full disclosure, um, Thomas Jefferson might think that it's the favorite drink of the civilized world. It is not my favorite drink. I don't drink coffee. Hmm. And this was rather interesting, having spent so much time living in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, because in that part of the world, coffee is king. Um, you, in most places, the three most popular flavors of ice cream are vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. In New England, it's vanilla, chocolate, and coffee. You buy coffee syrup to put in milk for children, just like you do chocolate syrup. When we were doing milk orders at school, the kids had a choice of plain milk, chocolate milk, or coffee milk. And I'm sitting there going, we're feeding these kids coffee milk. Yeah, we fed those kids coffee milk. So, you know, I never got into coffee, um, but coffee is one of the things to keep in mind is in terms of world trade, Coffee is second only to oil in the most valuable legally traded commodity. Okay, so coffee is important. Um, this one sign says that it's 2 billion cups of coffee are consumed every day worldwide. It's now up to 2.25 billion. And, you know, enormous number of American adults drink coffee uh, around the world. And that area around between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, that is the area where the majority of the coffee grows in the world. Um, Brazil, places in Africa, some places in, in Asia. Um, Brazil, number one producer of coffee, Vietnam, number two, Colombia, number three. Most coffee comes from the high altitude soils in Latin America and Africa. There is coffee grown and harvested in America, in Hawaii and California and Puerto Rico. We do not know where the word coffee comes from. Don't know the origin of it. There's three possible meanings and I think they're all made up. One, it's, we know it's from some form of Arabic or African language. It may come from, um, um, something that means lack of hunger, that you're no longer hungry. 
Uh, it may mean power or energy, or it may be a drink from berries. We don't know. They're just making that up. So here we are. This is actually in, in California. This is some, um, uh, this is coffee, coffee bushes. We're just seeing, I'm just seeing you. Okay, let me go back. Yeah. Are y'all okay. seeing? Let's go back. I'm just seeing y'all, the fa your faces. I'm not seeing any. Yeah, the screen share has not happened yet. Okay, yeah. let's go back to, and we'll do this again. And by okay. the way, I'm just doodling on cards while we talk. So if I'm looking down, it's not that I'm not paying attention. It helps me pay attention. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Do that. I like to write it all down. Let's see. Okay. Now, yeah, now we see it. Okay. Let's go. How about that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's the meme. Okay. Okay. Potion made from magic berries every day brings you back to life. And there's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this is actually, he said it just before his death that coffee was the favorite drink of the civilized world. Um, as I said, it is more than 2 billion cups of coffee are consumed every day in the world. Um, coffee is grown in this, this belt around the equator. And certainly with climate change, one of the things they're concerned about is what's going to happen to that, that coffee growing. Mm -hmm. It tends to, what's interesting is it, it's in this warm part of the world, but it tends to be in high altitudes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it looked, that's a field of coffee bushes. So, um, whether it means lack of hunger, whether it means power or energy, whether it means drink of berries, we don't really know. Um, and we don't even know when it started to be used. There is a legend that about 1200 years ago um, that there was a, a goat herder in Ethiopia that noticed that his goats started to go crazy after they eat, ate this berry from a bush. And he tried them out and, oh, this is good. And he had more energy. And he took them to a local Islamic monastery and the monk said, oh, this is terrible. These are bad. No, 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 can't do this. And he takes these berries and he throws them into a fire. And you can just imagine the smell. Oh. Went, Whoa. And so they rake the beans out and supposedly they added hot water and you had the first cup of coffee, but we really don't know. Um, we have no idea when the first coffee was used, how it was used, where it was used, somewhere probably around Ethiopia or Southern Arabia. And this is what a coffee berry looks like. Coffee comes from this bush-like plant and these are called cherries, they're coffee cherries. Um, and the coffee berry, the bean is actually the seed and we, it seems to be that the, these berries were at first mixed with animal fats and grains and used as an energy bar. They wasn't used as coffee, they were used as an energy bar, like you get the um, cranberries, dried cranberries in some sort it of- It looks like cranberries. Um, and the life cycle is you've got these bushes that bloom, they produce the green berries, and then the berries ripen. And the berries don't all ripen on the bush at the same time, which is why coffee has to be picked by hand. If you would pick this mechanically, you could see just from that cluster um, that you only have four berries that are useful, the rest are not ripe enough. So that for most coffee bushes, you can get four or five different um, harvests from it, but it all has to be picked by hand. Interesting. So if you open that cherry, you see um, 
inside there's a pulp um, and inside that is a bean or the seed, which we would call the bean. Um, the, the pulp of the, the uh, berry is, there isn't a lot of it, but it's edible. Uh, the taste varies a little bit by where it grows and the climate, uh, but it's very sweet. It's kind of honeyish. Um, and so you would pick the berries when they're ripe. You uh, dry them. Um, you take the berries out and the bean or the seed is inside. Um, and like popcorn, the bean gets bigger when it gets larger and lighter when it's roasted like popcorn. So Kathleen, is, is anything done with the, the pulp? There are places that turn it into wine. Um, but it's, it, there's so little pulp that it's not, it, it's not worth somebody's time and effort, but you, it certainly is edible. And historically, that's probably what they ate more than anything else. They ate the berries and spit out the seeds. Looks like a little brain. Yep. Well, if you think about it, lots of berries are like that. It just, you know, no. think of the seed as being smaller. Um, it's only about 800 years ago that we know that they began roasting the seed or the bean. And we don't know where or when that exactly happened. It may have been in Yemen. It may have been in Ethiopia. Um, we know that in that area, this is, um, Islam had begun to spread and there were a group of um, religious devout Muslims who were called Sufis and they would have long, long, long prayer vigils. And they begin to use this bean as a stimulant during this prayer vigil. Um, and whether they ate it in food or whether they drank it, we're not really sure. But we know that the people who grew this berry begin to boil or roast the bean because in, before they sold it to people, because that renders the bean infertile. So if you get the coffee berry, um, you've got the basis of a coffee tree, if a coffee bush, if, you, if it's not, you know, you can't go to the store and do it, get your coffee bean because it's been rendered infertile. Um, so the, smart guys in Ethiopia and Yemen began saying, hey, everybody wants this, but I don't want them to go in competition with me. So I'm going to roast this. I'm going to boil it. I'm going to keep it so that I'm the only one who can grow it. That reminds me of the nutmeg story. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The same sort of thing. Um, and we can see in this picture the traditional way that coffee was made. You took the beans and you put them in the mortar and pestle and you pounded them. Now you end up with fragments. They are not like ground coffee. They're thicker and they're lumpier and they're inconsistent in size. And then you would take those grounds because you've ground it up and you would put it in a pot and you would boil it. Okay, there's no filter. Um, and it tended to be very thick and very dark. Mm -hmm. Now, in some places in the Middle East, they might add some sugar syrup. In some places, they might add spices. But when this got, there are times that it would be poured that it would be more like the consistency of liquid mud than what you would think of as, as coffee. But as this spreads, there's a debate over this. There's the typical sort of thick coffee and the, the grounds are just in there. Um, and um, because Islam outlaws intoxicants, no alcohol. And so this is a stimulant, but is it alcohol? What is it legal? Is it not legal? And there was a government official who was responsible for public morality, who put coffee on trial about 700 years ago. He, the accused was a large container of coffee. Coffee <laughs> was found guilty. Uh, the coffee was destroyed. 
people who sold coffee and people who drank coffee were beaten, but ultimately, <coughs> it didn't take very long, the ruling was overturned. The problem, said the authorities, was not the coffee. The coffee was good, but the problem was where coffee was consumed because there were special places called coffee houses. And coffee houses were hotbeds of gossip. <laughs> People sat, went to the coffee house, they sat around, they drank coffee, um, and they talked about government and they talked about everything that you could think of. Um, the coffee becomes so, coffee houses become so important in society coffee becomes so important in society that in the Turkish culture, there was a law created that gave any woman the right to divorce her husband, which was not typical in, under Islamic law, but she could divorce her husband if he did not provide her with an adequate amount of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> pull around. That's funny. So <clears throat> begins, the use of coffee begins in the Arab world but it spreads. It spreads through trade, it spreads through conquest, um, and eventually it's going to make its way into Europe. And we have the coffee traders uh, spreading um, this word. But when coffee comes to Europe, the debate over coffee continues because many people began thinking that coffee was evil. You see, Muslims couldn't drink wine, and wine was a good Christian drink because you have it for communion. Right. And so because, said some people, because the Muslims couldn't drink wine, the devil gave them coffee. Yeah. And so they went to the Pope. They went to Pope Clement. And Pope Clement, they said, you need to ban this. You need to say that drinking coffee is a sin. But unfortunately, he tried it. And he liked it. <laughs> And he baptized coffee beans. I kid you not. Uh -huh. Coffee beans have been baptized Christians. Oh. <laughs> so you may drink coffee as much as you want to because it's a good Christian drink. Um, so, um, you know, it just, you kind of go, what? Well, yeah. That's nuts. It is nuts. <laughs> but one of the problems is when the beans came to Europe, they didn't know what to do with them. And it often took somebody who was familiar with the Arab world, who may have visited a coffee house to figure out how to, you, you just have these beans, what do you do? You know, you don't try to eat them. I don't know if you've ever put a coffee bean in your mouth and chewed on it. Um, I've tried them. Yeah, uh, probably not, not a good Not thing. good. Um, and... In 1683, the, the dark orange is the Ottoman or Turkish Empire, and it's expanding. It's getting larger and larger. And in fact, it is moving in very close to Vienna. And Vienna had been under siege. And, but that siege was broken in 1683, and the Turks retreated. And they left stuff behind because they had to leave quickly. They left tents. They left grain, they left livestock, they also left 500 sacks of coffee. And the Viennese had no idea what, to do, what this coffee was. One theory was that it was camel feet and they were gonna dump it into the Danube because they didn't have any camels. The, they, you know, the Turks had taken the camels back with them. Um, and there was a man who was living in Vienna, who had spent a lot of time in Turkey, and he had also been a spy for the people of Vienna during this war between the Viennese and the Austrians and the, the, the Ottoman Turks. And so he knew what this coffee was. And so he said, look, you know, I spied for you, I helped you, Let me, give me these 500 sacks. And they said, sure, now we're just gonna toss them in the river, why not, you can take them. And so he begins to make coffee. And he, he makes Turkish coffee, 
He goes door to door in Vienna, giving away samples, you know, knock, 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 here I am at the door, try this, you know. And he goes around and gets enough people who say, oh, 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 this is, I like this. He then sets up a tent and people come to him and eventually he's, he begins the first Viennese coffee shop. And within 10 years, all over Vienna, there are coffee shops. Um, and these coffee shops are not just in Vienna, but the idea of a coffee shop begins to spread all over Europe. Um, and these were places, the Europeans figure out how to make coffee and coffee houses become places where ideas are spread. Um, it was the owners of the coffee shop would get all the newspapers and they would invite people to come in. You could read the paper um, and uh, stay as long as you wanted. These become known as penny universities because for a penny, this is what a cup, a cup of coffee costs you, you got the coffee and conversations. The first coffee house in London was in 1652. By 1700, there are hundreds of coffee houses throughout London and they're beyond, they're in, in Oxford, they're in, in university towns, lots of coffee houses. Um, one of the coffee houses in London was Lloyd's Coffee House. And Lloyd's was a place where ship owners and sea captains and people who wanted to invest in shipping would hang out. And they kept records of what was happening in uh, trade and shipping. And that's where Lloyd's of London, the insurance company, got started. It was started in a coffee house with a bunch of guys sitting around a table, talking, drinking coffee. But not everyone approved. Doctors say, this is toxic. Others say it's just time wasting and it encourages trivial discussions. People just sit around and talk nothingness. And there were objections to the taste. One person called it spirit, syrup of soot or essence of old shoes. And in 1673, there was this pamphlet that came out which compared the appearance and flavor of coffee to Pluto's drink, Pluto being the god of the underworld, that witches drink out of dead men's skulls. Hmm, interesting picture. Um, and the typical coffee house stinks of tobacco worse than the hell of brimstone. Because as well as drinking coffee, they're smoking tobacco. And these were just terrible things. Uh, it goes, the author of this pamphlet goes on and says that coffee houses are a place where social classes mix um, without status, where they spread rumors. It's kind of like the coffee house was the Facebook, um, uh, <laughs> the, you know, of the 1670s. Um, this was just a terrible thing. And then there was this woman's petition of the following years in 1674. And I have to say, we're not sure whether this is serious or whether this is satire. This was an age of satire and we don't know well enough, but we know that this petition came out that talks about it being an abominable heathenous liquor called coffee. It made men too talkative, okay? They drink this coffee and they just talk and talk and talk. Um, and furthermore, it makes them impotent. Uh, uh. Well, there's a men's petition that came out right afterwards and that's definitely tongue in cheek. And they say that far from making them impotent, the coffee actually makes men better husbands because it dries up the crude flatulent humors so they'll no longer fart in bed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just never know. Oh, wow. King Charles, who's king in the 1670s, tries to outlaw coffee houses 
because people are sitting around and drinking and talking and arguing and debating politics. And for a king, you don't really want people to sit around and debate politics. He managed to ban coffee houses for a whole 11 days. And then there was such a rebellion, he had to lift that restriction. But he does manage to tax coffee. And coffee was taxed by the gallon. And you're going, wow, I, you know, who drinks a gallon? Coffee was made up. Now remember, they're just taking this, this beaten up mush of grounds, which is not regular in shape or anything else. And they're boiling it and they stored it in barrels. And you pay the tax, your coffee house, pay the tax on how many barrels of coffee they had. Now they would make this up in advance, they would pay their tax, and when you went in to re get a cup of coffee, they would reboil it. Uh, oh, that uh, sound good. It probably wouldn't be very good. But it's what they had. Um, and um, by the way, none of us would be able to go in that coffee house because no women for men only. Anyone who was in a coffee house was, well, you just didn't want to be around her. But with all this growth of coffee houses, there are, there's a huge demand for coffee. But the Arab world, that area around Ethiopia and Yemen, has a monopoly. And um, they, you know, John Smith takes coffee with him to the New World. And, you know, everybody wants more and more coffee. There's a limited supply um, and the beans that, are, that will be sold are roasted or dried to make them infertile. And so we begin to enter this period of time with let's get a coffee plant. And the first people to steal a coffee plant because it is stolen is the Dutch. And they manage to get a plant, a uh, small bush, and they take it back to Holland, but it won't grow in Holland because it's too, it just, you can't live with that climate. Mm -hmm. And so they try again. And at this point, they have some colonies in what we call the D Dutch East Indies. We know it as Indonesia today. And they try it. They plant this, this plant that they've stolen on that island, which is in red. And it does really well. They're able to, they get the plant in 1696. And by 1704, they're harvesting coffee. That island is called Java. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that's where we get the name. Name for Java, for coffee. Um, now, um, the Dutch, as in trying to prevent a war with France, give the king of France a small coffee bush to grow in his, his uh, greenhouse, shall we say, in Paris. Um, and a friend, it, it was protect, protected, they had guards around it most of the time. It wasn't going to really pr produce a lot of coffee or coffee beans, but it was like, oh, here's a coffee plant. Um, and there is a French adventurer who takes a cutting from the tree. And I don't know if ever you've taken a cutting of a plant or a shrub. Yeah. Uh, Forsythia works really well. You know, you cut the cut the branch off of forsythia, you put it in water, and pretty soon you've got roots and you've got another tree. Well, coffee bushes do the same thing. And so there's this French adventurer who steals a cutting from the um, plant in Paris, and he then sails to Martinique, which is a French colony, and he begins to, he plants it and it grows really well. Virtually every coffee plant in the Americas is a descendant of that coffee plant that was stolen from Paris and planted in Martinique. Wow. It gets to Brazil. Brazil is the biggest producer of coffee in the Americas by seduction. Um, the Brazilians wanted the coffee. They, um, there is a very handsome Brazilian um, military officer 
And he goes up to Martinique and he's doing a couple of things in business. There's a, a, a treaty that needs to be negotiated. And he also is gonna to try to get um, a, a, a coffee plant, um, at least to cut in if nothing else. And the governor is much more protective of his uh, coffee plants than he is of his wife. And the Brazilian manages to seduce the governor's wife. And they have a fairly long and very torrid affair for several months. And when he leaves, she gives him this big bouquet of flowers. And in the middle of the flowers are cuttings from coffee bushes. Mm. He gets them down, down to Brazil and he plants them. And thus we have Brazilian coffee. So um, coffee bushes originated Ethiopia, Yemen area of the world, probably Ethiopia, but they got every place else in the world by stealing and smuggling and seduction. Now, there are two, in the early 1700s, there were two primary ports where coffee was exported from. One was the island of Java in Indonesia. The other was the port of Mocha. Okay, now you know where those names come from. Coffee houses become the internet of the 16 and 1700s. They are a source of information. They are, um, you know, we're, maybe if we remember back to our childhood, when you had, maybe you lived in a town with two different newspapers. Um, you know, some cities had several morning papers and several evening papers. Um, and, you know, even today, um, if we want, you know, getting a newspaper, you can't get all the newspapers. I talked to a friend last night and she finally subscribed to the New York Times online because she really wanted to the um, uh, crossword puzzle. But, um, you know, if you'd like to read the New York Times, the Washington Post, the London Times, you know, all of these newspapers, you can't afford to get all of them by subscription. Um, and so you read, we read what we can read free online. But in the 1700s, the coffee houses would get subscriptions to all the papers. Um, and so customers would come in to read the news. Coffee houses also um, let you pick up your mail there. Um, so that was a good, you know, if you use that as your address, um, you know, I'm going to be in London, send my mail to Lloyd's Coffee House. That's a reason for you to go there. Um, Christopher Wren, Isaac Newton, all hung out in coffee houses and discussed their ideas. They actually gave lectures in coffee houses. And they certainly were a place for political discussion. Now, at the same time this is happening, the Industrial Revolution is going on. And the Industrial Revolution is the change from manpower to machine power. Pretty simple. And coffee feeds into this because um, people, drank coffee for breakfast starting during the Industrial Revolution. Well, what had they been drinking before? They had been drinking beer and wine before. That's what you had for breakfast. And um, why didn't you have water? Well, water is polluted. Um, why didn't you have milk? Milk wasn't pasteurized. Beer and wine were drinks that you could drink and not die, tea was still very expensive. So the Industrial Revolution, um, when you started having people going to work, having been drinking beer and wine every morning, that wasn't necessarily a safe thing to do. So coffee, which begins to replace beer and wine, gives people energy without intoxication and it was safer for them to work in um, the factories. Beer in England and in much of Europe, not so much France and Italy and Spain, but in Northern Europe, beer was the drink for everyone, morning, noon, and night. Basically, you drank beer all day. 
coffee was everywhere. In 1735, Johann Sebastian Bach penned Schweig stille plaudert nicht, which is the coffee cantata. In this song, a father and daughter duo argues over how she drinks much too much coffee, and that's why she doesn't have a lover. So she says, if I give it up, I will become so upset in my anguish, I will turn into a shrivel up roast goat. That's pretty ghastly to think about that. So her father gives her an ultimatum. She says, he says, give up coffee or else. She says she will, but she's lying. And while he's out finding her a husband, she tells her suitors that they must let her drink coffee if they want to marry her. Okay, but the coffee cantata. <laughs> this passion from, for coffee spread all over Europe and it also was brought to the Americas. Uh, and it, were, it really is going to change the Americas. In 1670, Dorothy Jones of Boston becomes the first person allowed to trade coffee in the colonies. A woman is able to do that. She gets a license. And licensing, of course, is another way of controlling um, what people are doing and it's tax on profit. Eventually, every major city has at least one coffee house, Philadelphia, Boston. The picture that's in color is the coffee house in Williamsburg. Um, coffee begins to replace beer uh, in New York as the breakfast drink, just like it replaced it in Europe. And in a coffee house called the Tontine Coffee House um, in New York City, uh, the New York Stock Exchange got its start. Also in that same coffee house, the Bank of New York got its start. That coffee house was located on a street called Wall Street. So this is where the financial heart of New York began in a coffee house. By the 1700s, taverns served as coffee houses and tea houses. So if you went into a tavern, we kind of think, well, tavern is alcohol. For them, if you went into a tavern, you could get coffee, you could get tea, you could get alcohol. All of them were kind of equal in usage. Um, and then we have this problem with the East India Tea Company. It's, okay, China has a monopoly. The East India Tea Company, the British East India Company has a monopoly. And in the 1760s, they decide to put a tax on that tea. The government needs money. The government has just fought a war to protect that started in the colonies, good old George Washington started that war um, or was one of the people who started that war. They think the colonists should help pay for this war. Uh, the colonists are saying, well, we don't have any say in this. And so the British decide, well, we're gonna put a tax on this tea. And as soon as the tax goes on the tea, which they can only get from Britain, the Americans begin sw switching to coffee, which they can get from Martinique, which they can get from Brazil, they can get it from all sorts of places in the Americas. There's no monopoly, there's no world monopoly on coffee. Um, and um, it becomes, people become incredibly uh, unhappy with the British government and this tax on tea and the taxes on some other things. And they meet at the Green Dragon in Boston and there they plan the Boston Tea Party. So it is in a coffee house as they're drinking coffee, they plan the Tea Party, which is one of the pivotal events starting the American Revolution. Yeah. A little ironic, isn't it, when you think about that? The yeah. Tea yeah. party started in a started coffee, coffee, house. coffee. Even yeah, though, as you house. said, they all drank all of it, but still. Yep. That's uh, trivia. Drinking coffee becomes patriotic. The founding fathers meet in coffee houses and they plan the revolution in coffee houses. Um, without coffee houses, where would they have discussed these ideas? John Adams actually writes to, to Abigail claiming that he loves tea. He absolutely adores tea, but he has to give it up. And he has to start drinking coffee 
because drinking tea is not patriotic. So with the American Revolution, we stopped drinking tea. And of course, the Boston Tea Party is not the only tea party. Tea was sent to four ports. Uh, it was sent to uh, Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Um, Charleston, uh, they bring the tea off the ships and put them in, the, put it in the basement of the Custom House. Um, New York, um, New York said, I think New York and Boston, I think, unload the tea and just leave it on the docks. It was, and that's what was going to happen in Boston, but the, the um, uh, governor who was in Boston said, you're going to have to unload this and you're going to have to store it someplace. The irony is that the East India Company had so reduced the price of tea that you were basically paying, getting the tea for free as long as you paid the tax. But for these people, it was the principle, I'm not paying this tax. Um, and they used smuggled tea. Smuggled tea was more expensive than the tea with the tax, but don't confuse me. So at this point, we begin the American love affair with coffee rather than with tea. And by the time of Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson replaces um, rum and brandy, the military rations, with coffee and sugar. I think, you know, there's a, the whole thing with alcohol in this country um, is fascinating because in the 1700s, students at universities got a ration of rum or brandy or beer or both or all of it as part of their room and board. Um, you know, drinking alcohol was very much part of everyone's life. Jackson says, I'm gonna, instead of having them do rum and brandy, um, we're gonna have them do coffee and sugar because actually the commanding officers were saying that there were a lot of problems with overindulgence in alcohol. In 1832, before Andrew Jackson put this order into place, the United States was importing 12 million pounds of, of coffee. Within a year, it's up to 38 million pounds. Kathleen? Yeah. Um, I think somebody's got a TV on in the background. I, your voice keeps getting interrupted on what I'm hearing by someone's television. Okay. Who's, who's not on mute? I'm not. I'll put them on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I didn't know. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I don't know if it was just me, but I, I kept getting her voice interrupted by background something. Thank you. So we start with 1832, 12 million pounds of coffee imported every year. Goes up to 38 million pounds. And this is at the same time the temperance movement is beginning in the United States. So we're going to, you know, coffee becomes the alternative to alcohol. Um, in the military, it helps soldiers refuel, it helps them stay focused. Um, and at the outbreak of the Civil War, so 1860, let's say 1860, we are now importing 182 million pounds of coffee. In a period of 30 years, we go from 12 million to 182 million pounds. We are living on coffee. And coffee becomes part of the rations of the Civil War in the North. The Confederates had tobacco, but they didn't have coffee. In the North, we had coffee. And each Union soldier was given 38 pounds of coffee beans every year. One historian went through Civil War diaries and he found that the word coffee was used more in those diaries than bullet, cannon, gun, war, slavery, Lincoln, or even mother. Okay, coffee, big. One general ordered his men to drink coffee before he sent them into battle because it would give them extra energy. In fact, there was a gun and you can see it there on the bottom that has a hand crank grinder built into the rifle stock, okay? So you poured your beans into the top and then you ground the handle and then you dump them out 
and you pour that in a pot and you put that or you know here, here you've got a, a pot up here they're, they're making coffee here i mean we just got we we throw this stuff in we put water in we put it over the, the um, fire and we just boil it away um now this was not available in the south and so the south asks looks for substitutes um rye rice sweet potato beets all of them would be dried ground mixed with water none of them have caffeine acorns were used and christopher orr says that he thinks sugarcane is good um you just have to boil it a little bit longer and um you know if people would um adopt its use um you know it would be a good thing of course i think he is growing sugar cane so he's got a he's got a dog in that fight um we do know that there were times during the civil war that the um soldiers <coughs> would get together there would be a, a truce and the soldiers from the north would trade their coffee for tobacco and the south would get coffee coffee for their tobacco you know everybody would win for that but you kind of go well why if the north can import coffee and it's coming from brazil uh or the islands why can't the south get it the south can't get it because the union has a really good blockade of all of those ports um so um coffee in the civil war by 1865, somebody's invented the percolator, which means they're not just boiling this in um, water. Um, by 1901, we've got instant coffee invented in Chicago. In World War II, uh, there were dehydrated packets of coffee sent out with the military rations. By World War II, the Americans have invented the coffee break. We need those people in the factories. We need those soldiers to be able to keep going. And so you give them a brief, brief rest, you give them a jolt of caffeine, and advertising kept this, this going. And by the mid 1950s, 70 to 80% of American workers got or took a coffee break. It was much part of the work day. It's what you had. The coffee begins to change. By the 1970s, we begin to have specialty coffee houses. Now, when you went into a restaurant in the 1950s or 60s, you would just order coffee. Now, if you went to the grocery store, you could buy Chock Full of Nuts, you could buy Maxwell House, you could buy, there were different brands. But when you went into a restaurant, you just got a cup of coffee. But starting in the 1970s, we begin to have what we call specialty coffees. You can see there the map of the United States, the states where we have more Starbucks, the states where we have more Dunkin' Donuts, and poor little Minnesota, the only place where caribou coffee, um, uh, coffee houses uh, outnumber all the others. Again, for full disclosures, when I was debating whether I should move down here from Massachusetts or not, Massachusetts being the home of Dunkin' Donuts. We have one about every uh, three blocks. Um, I made a list of, you know, what were things that I really liked about where I was living and were there things comparable here? There was an Ollie program, that, you know, and one of the things on my list, to be perfectly honest, was Dunkin' Donuts was here. Um, I don't drink coffee, but I do drink Dunkin' Donuts iced tea. So if we look at coffee, we do not drink, we reached our peak of drinking coffee just uh, per person um, right after World War I, World War II. And the amount of coffee that we're drinking is going down per person, um, but our specialty coffee consumption is going up. We more and more people are now drinking specialized coffee. They're going to Starbucks. They're going to specialized coffee houses. It's not just, you know, 
any old kind of coffee. So we've got some interesting uh, coffee facts here. Uh, and I think some of these need to be updated. 29% um, uh, of US households claim to own a single cup brewer. I think that number is probably higher today. Um, I think most workplaces have a coffee era, er, area. I don't think we have the official coffee break the way we used to, that everyone takes a break at the same time. I think it just, you run over and get a cup of coffee. Um, and we also know that the statistic shows us that, um, Coffee drinkers spend 45 hours a year in line to get a cup of coffee. Oh. That's longer than their work week. Okay. Um, and that, I'm sorry, Kathleen. That's right now. That's current. That one. That's actually. Well, before the pandemic. Ago. It's probably about 45 hours a year. We we people wait in line for coffee. And given the, what I've seen with lines at the drive throughs recently, we're probably adding to that. Wow. That of course is about the amount of time we spend in the shower. Um, Voltaire, the philosopher, drank 40 to 50 cups of coffee a day. He did mix it with, cho uh, with chocolate. Um, and he was told that it was a slow working poison. And his response was, I've been drinking it for 65 years and I'm not dead yet. So yeah, it's slow acting. Beethoven uh, drank coffee and every cup of coffee he made was made with exactly 60 beans. So you're gonna take 60 beans, you're gonna grind them up, you're gonna boil them up and that's gonna be your cup of coffee. President Roosevelt um, drank a gallon of coffee a day. Um, his son says it was more, his uh, coffee mug was more like a bathtub. But President Roosevelt was also responsible, supposedly, when he finished a cup of coffee, he said it was good to the very last drop. And the coffee was Maxwell House. And you may remember that slogan. Um, coffee is responsible for the first webcam. There were a group of researchers in the University of Cambridge in England. They had a room where there was a coffee pot and they would be working in their labs. This is in 1991. And they would want a cup of coffee and they would go out and oh, there was no coffee. And they didn't want to be the one to make it. So they were really very frustrated because they didn't know if there was coffee or not. And so they set up a camera so that they could see whether or not the camera was directed on the coffee pot and they could see whether or not there was coffee in it. Now, as soon as they get the web in there, they connect this camera to the internet. And until 2001, we all could watch that coffee pot to see whether it was full or empty. Um, so webcam. Coffee spending in the United States, the average American spends somewhere between $1,100 and $1,200 a year. Um, a study that was done in 2019 said that people spend $4.63 on average on coffee every weekday. Does not account for weekends, but every weekday. But what is interesting is that although the amount of coffee consumption um, is only increased by 1% 1, 1 between 2015 and 2020, the change in spending has gone up 3%. So we're spending more on coffee, but not necessarily drinking more. And that has to do with that. Some has to do with just coffee prices going up. Some has to do with the um, um, demand for specialty coffee. So specialty coffee, uh, 
the price of coffee beans going up. If you are um, really into coffee, you might know that um, uh, as a rule of thumb, the lighter the roast, the more caffeine there's in it. So a light roast in the morning is gonna give you a jolt and carry you through the, a, a day. The darker the roast, the less caffeine. Um, so if you don't want a lot of caffeine, you're, you want a darker roast. And I've got the picture there with the donuts because you know, I know that um, there are, let me get, get this, um, New York City has the most coffee shops, coffee houses, and cafe per capita. It also has the most uh, uh, donut shops per capita. And there seems to be this, this uh, link between donuts and coffee. Um, so, you know, never know. Kathleen, back. Kathleen said, when I was in New York City last year, we Googled Starbucks and on the island of Manhattan, there were 234 Starbucks. Yep. You probably can stand in front of one Starbucks and look down the street and see another one. No. Balzac said, coffee falls into the stomach, ideas begin to move, things remember to arrive at full gallop, and the shafts of wit start up like sharpshooters. Similes arise, the paper is covered with ink. So if you want to be a writer, says Balzac, got to drink your coffee, which may be my problem. So um, looking ahead, I'm, I'm going to go with beer next week. Um, you know, we're going to have Labor Day weekend. People traditionally have cookouts, sit around, have beer. I know that there's one person who, when she has pizza, wants to have beer. Um, so um, we're going to do beer. I'm going to Statue of Liberty, a never ending house in California. Um, go to India with a love story in stone and may end up September with potatoes. And I am taking ideas and suggestions and thoughts. Um, I am, I don't necessarily like battles, um, but if you let me know where in the world you would like to learn about or when, uh, I would say to my students when we would do research papers, they'd say, I don't know what to do. And I'd say, tell me where and tell me when, and I'll give you a topic and I can do that for you guys as well. So if you have suggestions, um, let me know. So. Cool. That was fun. Thank yeah, you. well, 